Hi, I'm Andrew Horvai, and I will be uh, participating in the ISS core lecture series today talking to you about benign cartilage tumors. Um, benign cartilage tumors encompass the various chondromas, and depending on the site, those might be referred to as enchondroma. For example, if you have an intramedullary tumor, juxtacortical, soft tissue, or synovial chondroma, respectively, for tumors that are located in those anatomic compartments. I'll also talk briefly about osteochondroma and chondroblastoma uh, to wrap up this discussion. Um, as I discussed in my giant cell rich lesions talk, um, you cannot make a diagnosis of uh, a cartilage or bone tumor without correlating the pathologic findings with clinical and more importantly, the imaging. Um, for all of these tumors, the treatment is basically curatage if the tumor is symptomatic or observation for those that are discovered incidentally. Um, generally speaking, curatage or even intralesional uh, partial excision is considered curative um, in that the tumors have um, very little risk of recurrence and virtually uh, no risk of malignant transformation. Depending on um, the series you read, enchondromas, there are some case reports of sporadic enchondromas undergoing malignant transformation into chondrosarcoma, um, and maybe slightly more reports of that happening in sporadic osteochondroma. Um, but the numbers are, uh, for the most part, considered extremely low. So these are truly benign lesions. Um, I do want to contrast the malignant transformation potential of sporadic lesions with um, analogous lesions that occur in the setting of syndromes. So what am I talking about there? Well, uh, enchondromas specifically can occur as part of uh, two different syndromes, closely related syndromes called Ollie disease um, and Mifuchi syndrome. And both of these entities, the patients have multiple enchondromas. Um, and in addition to that, in Mifuchi syndrome, they have a variety of other tumors, specifically spindle cell hemangiomas and then assorted other neoplasms. Uh, we now know that both of these are driven by um, new mutations in the IDH1, the isocitrate dehydrogenase 1, or IDH2 genes, respectively. Um, these are not inherited disorders. These are sporadic. Um, but the important thing to remember is that uh, patients who develop enchondromas in the setting of these syndromes do have a higher lifetime risk of a chondrosarcoma, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%, again, depending on the series you read. Contrasting that with um, patients who have multiple osteochondromas, the syndrome there is called multiple hereditary exostoses, this actually is an inherited disease. Um, frequently, it's inherited in an aut autosomal dominant fashion. Um, and the mutations there are in the genes EXT1 and EXT2. In addition to osteochondromas, these patients have usually profound skeletal deformities, as I will um, show you later in the talk. And they too have a, an increased lifetime risk of malignant transformation of one of their osteochondromas again, to chondrosarcoma, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 35%, once again, depending on the series that you read. Um, I already hinted on the fact that uh, you really can't make the diagnosis of a cartilage tumor without correlating the radiology. Foremost, the, the single most important question to ask when you're looking at something histologically that looks like a highland cartilage lesion is, am I dealing with an intraosseous tumor, a surface tumor, a synovial tumor, a pure soft tissue tumor, because that will change the approach to the diagnosis. And the imaging is what will tell you that. It will tell you where the tumor is centered, and furthermore, will tell you about um, whether there's an aggressive growth pattern. Is the tumor, like it's shown here, exploding from the medullary cavity into the soft tissue, or a soft tissue tumor that's invading and permeating into the medullary cavity from the outside in? Those would be features that you would would raise the alarm that you're dealing with something more than just a benign cartilage tumor. <clears throat> so the, the hallmark radiographic finding for all of the tumors I'm going to talk about, and essentially all highland cartilage tumors, um, is a particular kind of calcification on plane radiology, plane radiography uh, described as ring-like or arc-like, or sometimes cloudy, looks sort of like cumulus clouds calcifications, as shown in the image on the left. Um, and what you see almost is a ring within ring kind of pattern of a pacification. The, the highland cartilage matrix actually will be radiolucent. It doesn't have any mineral to absorb the x-rays. But 
what happens is you have this this pattern of peripheral ossification, endochondral ossification that occurs around the periphery of nodules of cartilage, and those do mineralize, and they produce those nice ring and arc-like patterns of calcification. So if you look at a radiology report of a cartilage tumor, you'll typically pick up the terminology. It'll be in the description that there's a ring-like or arc-like uh, calcified matrix suggesting a cartilage tumor, then you'll want to see how aggressive it might be. So let's just turn to the first entity. Enchondroma is the probably the most common entity in this list of tumors. This is an intramedullary benign hyaline, hyaline cartilage tumor. Uh, they typically arise in the diaphysis or the metaphysis of long bones. The most common site are actually the phalanges, but they can occur virtually in any long bone. Uh, much less common in the um, more proximal skeleton, the shoulder and um, pelvic girdles. You do see benign cartilage tumors there, but they're less common. And histologically, that corresponds to a very sharp demarcation of this is the cortex down here, um, and this is the tumor. And there's very sharp demarcation of the cortex in the tumor. That is, the tumor does not permeate an intrap host bone. It does not pass through the perversion canals out into the soft tissue. For the most part, the tumors have low cellularity and low atypia, uh, though if you compare the chondrocytes of an enchondroma to the chondrocytes of the normal articular cartilage, they actually tend to have a little bit higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, maybe a little bit more spindling. The cells aren't purely round. The lacunae are not as, as crisply defined either. They're, um, sometimes the cells seem to just be floating in the matrix rather than being in a, a defined um, lacune, um, and maybe you can start to make out some nuclear detail. Normally, chondrocytes have a very pycnotic, tiny little uh, hyperchromatic nuclei, and in neoplastic cartilage like a benign enchondroma, the nuclei can grow a little bit larger than that. This is a feature of all benign cartilage tumors, and that's one that I alluded to already in talking about the radiology, and that's the endochondral, or some people just call it enchondral ossification. And what happens is as the tumor matures, the cartilage matrix turns from this um, proteoglycan rich, so blue matrix, to a more collagen rich pink matrix, and ultimately that transforms um, with the help of osteoblasts into osteoid, which then mineralizes into bone. Um, when you see this pattern, this kind of gray gradient of maturation of conventional hyaline cartilage to more uh, pink kind of fibrous cartilage to osteoid, and, and that's a nice smooth transition, that's endochondral ossification. And that is an entirely benign feature, and it can be seen in all sorts of benign cartilage tumors. Um, and it is not permeation, which is a term that you should hear about um, if you listen to the talk on malignant cartilage tumors. Permeation um, or entrapment of host bone um, is when this Interface is not a nice smooth gradient, but is rather abrupt. Um, so benign cartilage tumors have endochondral ossification. It should not be mistaken for permeation. If you see enough enchondromas, particularly in the setting of Allier disease, Mafuchi syndrome, you will see examples that have more cellularity, uh, very abundant mixoid rather than hyaline matrix. Um, perhaps you'll see cells that begin to um, nest so that there are multiple cells within a single lacoon, not an uncommon feature. Uh, and these findings that I'm showing here are still within the spectrum of a benign enchondroma. This degree of cellularity and nuclear atypia is certainly still within the, spec within the spectrum of a benign tumor, um, provided that you review the imaging findings to make sure that there's nothing aggressive radiographically. In the setting of Allier and Mifuchi syndrome, we see or either Allier or Mifuchi syndrome specifically, we'll see multiple um, intramedullary lesions, so multiple enchondromas, and most frequently they'll affect the digits first. So you'll see these patients with quite deformed fingers. Um, and in fact, the risk to these patients isn't just the, the lifetime risk of having a malignancy, but it's the deformity um, and morbidity of not being able to use their fingers very well. Um, obviously, the treatment here is challenging because though they can be curetted, the, the morbidity associated with curating all these phalanges and filling them with cement um, might be greater than the, uh, than the benefit of doing the procedure. Um, so these are characteristic, and you can't tell based on this imaging whether this patient has Ali or Mafuchi. You would need to know whether they have any associated um, other findings. I have noticed that the enchondromas, these phalang especially in the phalanges, the enchondromas of uh, Ali disease and Mafuchi syndrome do tend to have more epithelioid-looking, plumper chondrocytes with slightly larger nuclei. Generally speaking, um, you know, chondrocytes of enchondroma have, as I said, pycnotic small dark nuclei and you shouldn't usually be able to make out much nuclear detail or see nucleoli in them. But in all the A disease specifically and Mifuchi syndrome specifically, you do tend to see that. You see more atypia. 
higher NC ratios, um, larger, maybe even slightly vesicular nuclei, and that's still okay for the diagnosis of an enchondroma, provided, again, that the imaging looks bland and there's no transcortical spread. Um, I'm not going to talk about soft tissue tumors in this talk, but this is just an example of what a spindle cell hemangioma looks like, um, which is one of the secondary tumors that patients with Mifuchi syndrome get. So they have these interesting endothelial cells that look almost like fat cells in spindle cell hemangioma. Juxtacortical chondroma is the second entity I want to talk about. And you can basically take everything I just told you about enchondroma and simply put the tumor um, stuck onto the outside of the bone onto the cortex. So radiographically, what you see is rather than an intramedullary tumor with cloudy calcifications, you see a tumor that scallops uh, or saucerizes the bone from the outside, as you can see in this distal femoral lesion, um, or you can see in this uh, phalangeal lesion in the foot. And actually, you can probably still make out that there are still ring calcifications within this lesion, but it isn't coming from inside the bone. It's stuck on the outside, um, usually with an area of cortical sclerosis. So the native cortex is actually thickened um, as it is reacting to this tumor, uh, pushing on it, if you will, from the outside. And uh, this is the histology, um, again, probably not too surprising. You have the intact cortex down below, but rather than having an intramedullary tumor, we're now on the outside of the bone, uh, and this tumor is actually tacked onto, it's intimately associated with the um, underlying cortex, uh, but does not extend down into the medullary cavity. In fact, the cortex is thicker here than normal. Um, and if there's a periosteal layer, it's not on this select section because it would be um, off the screen covering the uh, periosteal or juxtacortical chondroma. Those terms are interchangeable. I sometimes use juxtacortical and sometimes periosteal for the same entity. These are also benign tumors. Again, this is your prototypical benign cartilage tumor. You have very small chondrocytes with tiny pycnotic nuclei, really hard to make out nuclear detail unless you went down at 40x. Um, you will note in this image that there are some chondrocytes that are necrotic. Uh, they look like they have maybe in, are dead from ischemia because they lack nuclei. And that's actually a common feature of all cartilage tumors, benign and malignant. So that is not a feature of malignancy either. Um, if you'll recall that cartilage doesn't have any vascular supply, and that, that's true for, for neoplastic cartilage as well. So the chondrocytes receive all their nutrition by diffusion, and therefore it's not surprising that um, as tumors grow uh, a substantial size that there'll be some uh, necrosis, there'll be some ischemic necrosis of chondrocytes, um, but not a prognostic feature, not one that should make you concerned about um, necrosis. Um, there's another example of a juxtacortical chondroma that was particularly myxoid uh, with probably a little bit more nuclear pleomorphism. You can see that not all cells have round pycnotic nuclei. Some have a kind of a strange stellate shape, and this one even has a nucleolus. So once again, you are allowed to accept this degree of atypia, this degree of myxoid change in cellularity in a juxtacortical chondroma with benign appearing radiographic features, provided you review those. All right, so we take the same tumor, um, and now it's no longer tacked onto the surface of the bone, but now it is, it's existing completely separate from the bone in the soft tissues, uh, but with the same histologic features, and that would be considered a soft tissue chondroma. Uh, this nomenclature is not complicated. So here you go. Here's the kind of cloudy calcifications of a tumor with no effect at all on the bones um, on either side of it. Uh, and this is an excision of one from the hand um, that was closely associated with a nerve that had to be um, dissected from, a nice little circumscribed ball of hyaline cartilage. These tend to have more degenerative and calcification type features than I find in the, um, the ones associated with a bone. I don't know if it's because they're traumatized more because they're in more superficial locations or there's something underlying different about the biology, but it's not unusual to see central ossification of the tumor. The, the thing to recognize in this histologic image is that there's no native bone. There's no native cortical bone around. The only bone you see here is in the middle of the, te of the lesion, um, and it's essentially a budding uh, tendon type tissue or ligament type tissue around the outside of it or you'll see fat or muscle around the outside. Um, so it's purely existing as a soft tissue mass with secondary endochondral ossification. Um, here's an example of a very high power image of, of a soft tissue chondroma. Um, like, the, like the chondromas of Alie Mafuchis, I think these tend to have um, maybe slightly larger nuclei and occasional nucleoli are not uncommon. I have not spoken much about binucleation of chondrocytes. You'll notice there's a couple of chondrocytes here uh, with two nuclei. So binucleation in and of itself is not a very helpful prognostic feature in cartilage tumors. Um, you can see binucleation in benign cartilage tumors all day long. The question is, what do those nuclei look like? And so if the nuclei look strikingly bizarre with marked 
hyperchromasia and bizarre large nucleoli, then that's a problem. Then you're you're encroaching on what would be considered sort of grade three nuclear features of a cartilage tumor. But what I'm showing you here uh, is still within the spectrum of what can be seen in a benign soft tissue chondroma. That doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. Once again, though, reviewing the imaging findings to make sure that you, what you're dealing with really is a soft tissue chondroma and not a bone tumor, which has exploded out of the cortex into the soft tissues, because that usually defines it as a more aggressive lesion. <clears throat> but don't worry too much about binucleation. Here are just some more degenerative things. Not only is there usually um, sort of central ossification, but you can see um, non-ossified matrix, just um, probably calcium hydroxyapatite type crystals or calcium phosphate crystals in these. Um, and sometimes the calcifications can be um, kind of granular as in the image on the right. And some very strange kind of bizarre looking cells, but they have very smudgy chromatin. It looks more like a degenerative type of atypia than the kind you see in malignant cartilage tumors. And what can be helpful here is that, uh, you know, with cells this large, you if you really thought they were malignant, there should be some proliferative activity. And these soft tissue chondromas have essentially no mitotic activity. Um, so that's a, a reassuring feature that what you're seeing here is kind of chronic degeneration and calcification of the tumor with some resultant cytologic atypia that's again, probably degenerative and not, um, and not suggesting that there's malignant transformation. Um, if you see a benign cartilage tumor associated with a joint, a synovial joint, so for example, the knee or the hip, uh, we see also the shoulder and the elbow commonly affected, that would be a synovial chondroma. But more frequently, these are multi-nodular tumors rather than a solitary mass like I've been describing for the the previous tumors, these are usually multiple separate little nodules of cartilage. Um, some of them are within the joint space. Sometimes they actually seem to migrate out of the joint space and can get into a bursa, um, or they can actually migrate quite some distance away from the joint um, into the into the uh, muscles nearby. And this would be then not synovochondroma, but synovochondromatosis. Uh, the radiologists are pretty good actually at diagnosing this uh, without even a biopsy frequently because you see a purely soft tissue mass with the characteristic calcifications that um, that uh, that allude to the fact that it's cartilage and then radiogra or grossly you see uh, some have described these as joint mice. I think Synovial chondromatosis obviously is a better diagnosis to use because it's very specific. Multiple nodules of varying si uh, sizes and shapes of um, this shiny, uh, pale cartilage. Uh, here's a, uh, a kind of an extreme example. You would almost never see um, you know, a joint with the synovial chondromatosis removed in toto, but this was a, a recurrence, and this patient had, as you can actually see, pretty significant uh, joint disease. Their articular cartilage is eroded because of the presence of these tumors. You'll recall that uh, the synovial chondromatosis could be right inside the joint in between the two articular surfaces, and that's going to cause some injury. So this patient actually underwent a joint replacement. This is the tumor up here, um, and it consists of multiple nodules of hyaline cartilage, maybe with some endochondral ossification beginning to happen in the middle. It's outside the bone, it's outside the joint, um, usually covered with a thin capsule that if you um, inspect at high power, you can actually see that there's a layer of synovium lining that. And the cellularity, again, can be somewhat high. Um, the nuclear atypia um, can be somewhat higher than what you see in intramedullary lesions, but it's very reassuring radiographically when you find that a tumor is extra osseous, that it's in the synovium. One particularly interesting feature of synovial chondromatosis that I don't see in the um, the other, the enchondromas, the juxtacortical ones, um, is that the chondrocytes in synovial chondromas, synovial chondromatosis, tend to uh, form this kind of clustering arrangement where they grow in little groups rather than a, in an evenly distributed or kind of haphazard pattern. So if you have some cartilage tumor on your slides uh, um, pathologically and you're seeing this pattern of clustering, you might already uh, suspect that maybe you're dealing with synovial chondromatosis um, before you go and review um, you know, the clinical history and the radiographic findings. <clears throat> um, that, again, doesn't tend to occur in, uh, in the various other cartilage tumors that I'm speaking of today. Um, osteochondroma, uh, it's usually discussed in the uh, category of cartilage tumors, although um, this tumor is not a pure cartilage tumor. Um, it actually is a tumor with a cap of cartilage, but then underlying bone. So it's more of an osteocartilaginous tumor. Uh, <clears throat> it, it usually 
uh, exists as an exophytic mass that grows out from a pre-existing bone. In this case, it's the ilium. On the right here, it's the tibia. When they do so, when along long bones, they tend to point away from the nearest joint. So that's a very classic finding. The cartilage cap of the tumor is usually about a centimeter, sometimes less, um, is not mineralized. So on plain x-rays, you wouldn't see anything there. Typically, there's just a layer of lucency. So what you do see is the stalk of the lesion. And it's very characteristic radiographically that the stalk of an osteochondroma um, actually is contiguous with the underlying medullary cavity. Um, so it's, a, it's almost as if the body has produced another articular surface, one that doesn't actually articulate with anything. Um, and in a, in a weird sense, that's actually what's happening. The activation of this abnormal EXT1 or EXT2 gene is actually turning on the program, if you will, um, to create another uh, epiphysis. And um, there's no place for that to articulate and the obviously the the way that it's growing isn't completely normal so it doesn't look like a completely normal end of the bone but it is analogous to that um, so grossly they can be sessile as the one on the left uh, with a cartilage cap and then the underlying kind of cancellous medullary bone and again recall that this medullary bone if you kept following it would you lead you into the medulla of whatever bone um, this arose from this is a more pedunculated one that has a nice stalk it almost looks like a tubular adenoma, if you will, of the colon, but you have this stalk of bone with medullary bone in it that would be contiguous with the underlying bone. Um, and then here's the cartilage cap, kind of a thin little cartilage cap on the outside. <clears throat> Um, histologically, they have a very characteristic appearance. There's typically a layer of um, periosteum on the outside, or perichondrium, I guess I should say, um, about a centimeter thick cap of cartilage. In a young patient, you'll see what looks like a growth plate. So there'll be um, chondrocytes that grow to um, sort of a hypertrophic state, and then they ultimately apoptose. And osteoblasts come in and replace that matrix of cartilage with bone. And then you lead you leading you into this marrow cavity, which then again leads you all the way into the marrow cavity of the underlying bone. So this perfect kind of transition that looks very much like uh, the articular surface and a primary growth plate would look of a long bone. Um, here's another example of one uh, again with this out, outside cap. Nice circumscription. There's no evidence that this cartilage is trying to you know destructively grow through the capsule. It's typically held in place there, and this one still has what looks to be sort of a maturing growth plate. In older patients, that growth plate, um, that maturation will actually cease, just like it would in um, in the uh, native end of the bone in an adult. <clears throat> and uh, typically, there'll just be an abrupt transition from cartilage to lamellar bone there. And just like the other tumors, these can have areas of myxoid change, maybe slight hypercellularity. The chondrocytes tend to be somewhat disorganized. They don't necessarily line up in perfect columns like in a growth plate, um, but there is a tendency to at least have a suggestion of columnar growth. I'm just showing this example to just show you how much myxoid change and um, the degree of cellularity that you might see, which is you know moderate at most. Um, this is a patient with multiple hereditary exostosis. So instead of having just a solitary osteochondroma, they have osteochondromas all over the body. And um, as I suggested, they always point away from the nearest joint. Um, in addition to osteochondromas, though, these patients actually have kind of more profound deformities of their bones. Their normal growth plates are not normal. So they have a lot of bowing and foreshortening of limbs and um, short stature, um, in addition to the deformities induced by the osteochondromas. And this example here is an older osteochondroma in an adult, which doesn't have a growth plate anymore. So you just have the cartilage cap <clears throat> And then underlying lamellar bone, basically this is the medullary cavities. There's no more active growth plate. And uh, occasionally there'll be a, a bursa overlying these. So you have this bony prominence under the skin. You might see a, um, a potential space of synovial fluid that um, overlies an osteochondroma. So that's another thing you might note if one is removed um, in whole. And finally, I'm going to talk about chondroblastoma. Now, I actually addressed this topic in my talk on giant cell-rich lesions. I think it actually be, probably belongs there a little more than it does here because I think the differential comes up more um, as a giant cell-rich lesion, but it does have the word chondro in its name, so I will go over it here. Um, it turns out if you look at the proteins in chondroblastoma matrix, they're more like osteoid. And these tumors rarely, if ever, actually have hyaline cartilage in them. <clears throat> 
So these are usually tumors of children, uh, typically, uh, and they tend to produce the, uh, lytic lesions in the ends of bones. So they're epiphyseal lesions, although they can have a slight metaphyseal component, usually well marginated. They can have internal calcifications. And um, the greater trochanter is actually um, sort of a, a virtual epiphysis, if you will. It's an apophysis. There's another growth plate there. And so there is another location for chondroblastoma that that these uh, that can occur. Um, we also see them in unusual sites. They can occur in the temporal bone, um, in the calcaneus, talus. We occasionally see them as well. Um, but most commonly epiphyseal, again, most commonly young patients. It has a, it doesn't have a characteristic cartilage matrix on imaging. It has more of a kind of a granular matrix. And it has three characteristic features histologically. Um, and usually you find two of the three in most cases. So one is the matrix has this fibrochondroid appearance. The cells do look like they're in lacunae in a sense, uh, but they're not clearly chondrocytes. They're more um, kind of ovoid plasmacytoid to spindle cells. And the matrix isn't hyaline cartilage. It's much pinker. It's more fibrous. <clears throat> Second, um, the matrix has a tendency to calcify in this very peculiar kind of pericellular pattern, if you will. So that is individual chondroblasts are surrounded by calcium. And that produces, if you back away from the image, what's called a chicken wire pattern or chicken wire calcification pattern. And that's considered a very characteristic, if not pathognomonic, but very characteristic feature of chondroblastoma. And then the third feature is that the cytomorphology of the mononuclear cells in chondroblastoma um, shows nuclear grooves. So the tumor cell nuclei have this kind of clefted coffee bean shape to them. Note that there are osteoclast type giant cells in here as well, um, which have kind of a different nucleus. They have more fine chromatin and small nucleoli, but the neoplastic cells have these nuclear grooves. They look usually more plasmacytoid, kind of an eccentric cytoplasm, sometimes a very sharp um, plasma membrane as well. So that's the mononuclear cell population, but they do contain giant cells. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up with just a couple of take-home messages on the benign cartilage tumors. Um, you cannot make these diagnoses with you know, any reasonable certainty without reviewing the radiographic images and correlating where is the lesion and how aggressively is it behaving. And um, just to an extent, also the clinical findings, this is a patient with multifocal disease, i.e. OLA disease. Um, be aware of the secondary degenerative changes, particularly that pattern of calcification and kind of smudgy chromatin and nuclear enlargement, especially in the soft tissue chondromas um, that might mis be mistaken for malignancy. Soft tissue chondromas virtually all are benign if it's truly a purely soft tissue mass. Um, and all these lesions can be treated with simple curatage. In fact, they could all be observed if the patient um, is asymptomatic. Um, but if they are symptomatic with curatage and they're typically cured, but be, be aware that patients who have syndromes, who have either multiple osteochondroma syndrome or Ollier Mafucci, um, do have a higher lifetime risk of having a malignant one of these um, over time. Um, with that, I will um, stop and I thank you for your attention.